Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight for this webinar in our Fertility Network Trying to Conceive series. Now as an organisation we're here to offer free advice, support and understanding to anyone that's affected by fertility issues. Now we consider it really important to have the opportunity to explore the subject of donor conception and of course any related emotional issues. Now to help us do this I'm absolutely delighted tonight to be joined by Nina Barnsley. Nina's the director of the Donor Conception Network. Hi, Nina. Hi, Heather. Hi, everybody. I'm not so, sure. Um, do you want me to move forward and then carry on, take over, or? Um, no, I just we were just waiting because no. there was just a little bit of a delay. I think it might just be the internet connection. I'm just going to tell people how they um, submit okay. questions and then I'll pass over to you. But it's lovely to have you here tonight. We're absolutely delighted. Now Nina brings me. There was a pause and I suddenly thought, oh, was I supposed to was I supposed to stop it? Not at all, not at all. No, it's just we were waiting because, um, as I say, the connection wasn't great there. Now, Nina brings her wealth of ex expertise to the table, and I'm sure many of you will have lots of questions to ask her once she's finished her presentation. So, if you want to submit a question, all you have to do is hover your cursor down at the bottom of your screen, go into Q&A, and we ask you to just select the anonymous function before you type in your question. This will just prevent any accidental disclosure of your personal details as this session is going to be recorded and other people will watch it later so just type in your questions as you think of them but remember we won't come back to them until Nina's actually finished now Nina I think we're ready to hand over to you now so I'm going to disappear and mute myself have fun thank you and thanks very much to Fertility Network UK for um, giving me this opportunity. Let's hope that the, yes, welcome everybody. I'm gonna be talking this evening about um, exploring uh, ideas around donor conception as a way to either create or expand your family. So another way that we might Oh, let's see if I can make this work. Yeah. Uh, another sort of subtitle that I thought was for most people, uh, that loss of genetic connection. Um, difference is a different way to have a family. Decision making, it's a lot of decisions and uh, often they're quite complex and some of them can be contradictory and with a lot of emotional uh, issues to, to work through with the decision making. And ultimately, I think what I'm hoping to do with this webinar is to help you build confidence so that you go forward with whatever decision you make, uh, feeling that it's right for you and right for your family. So what I'm going to do this evening, I'm hoping to spend about half an hour uh, covering the following topics. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about donor conception, so what it is and who uses it. Mention a little bit about the different kinds of donors that people bring, the things that you need to consider. And I'm hoping that some of the things that are maybe things that resonate already that you're worried about. There may be other things that you haven't thought of. And certainly um, we would be a place that you could go to to help think through some of these things. Because a lot of feelings and issues come up when people are contemplating donor and some of those in this presentation. Possibly one of the biggest ones is openness. And one of the things that people can feel most anxious about is how they're going to explain this to a child, maybe to other people, to friends and family. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit Little bit about why it's and how you might go about sharing information and to finish off with I'm going to look at how DC Network can help we have got lots of resources that hopefully will help you build confidence and help enable you to take the next step whatever that might be okay so to start off with what is donor conception 
And um, I'm, I'm sort of opening with, with a question of, is it a fertility treatment that has treatment? I think some people may be doing it um, uh, privately uh, at home. But uh, if you are using a, a clinic, it will be classified um, as, a, as a treatment to infertile men. And in a way that presents it in perhaps a slightly different way to how it might be more helpful to think about it. So I think from DC Network's point of view, we look at what you need to make a baby. So you need an egg, you need a sperm, and you need somewhere for the baby to grow. Then you are going to have to bring that element in from outside of the family. And when I'm saying the family, I'm really talking about the people who are going to be raising the child. So it is possible you might be using a donor or a surrogate who is actually a family member, um, but they're not going to be mum or dad to this child and they're not going to be raising of, of the family. So this is a different route to parenthood, bone sperm and eggs, um, it's different to other fertility treatments and so in some ways it, it sort of needs a different way of, way of thinking. There are different questions to answer and, and different decisions that need to be made. One of the things that we'll need to think about is who the donor is, is in this picture. We're bringing in an ingredient from outside of the family so it's important to consider where's that coming from who, who is this person that I'm inviting in and, and uh, how I find them, how important are they, what's going to make sense for me. Um, there are important long-term implications of donor conception for the whole family, so that has implications for, for, for parents, for children, um, but then that will perhaps feed into helping you make a decision on what kind of donor you're looking for so for some people that might they may uh, be very clear that they want an identifiable donor for other people they may not want to make such a big decision they'd rather the clinic made the decision and did a matching process uh, so it could be really different for different individuals and I think it's really important that people stop and pause and think how for everybody uh, and and so, and it's fine if, if, if people decide that it isn't right for them. So just a quick, lots and lots of different people use own conception. Um, there might be heterosexual couples who've got fertility issues or medical issues that mean that they, that they can't have more egg donations, sometimes double donations, sometimes with surrogacy. Um, Same-sex couples and single people will obviously be missing an ingredient in the family makeup and so they'll need to use a donor but sometimes they might be using more than one donor so we've used double donation and um, they're, they're, then obviously gay men will be using egg donation with surrogacy so there's a real mix of, of, of family types and types of and so you know and one of the things that we sometimes pride ourselves on as an organisation is that we actually have a lot of diversity in our, in our charity and in our membership. So then who might the donor be? So a donor could be a family member, as I mentioned before, uh, or might be a friend or an acquaintance or somebody who is known to you. It might be somebody that you've perhaps met through a website or, or a Facebook page. And perhaps more likely, I don't know, um, not sure who's, who's watching the webinar this evening, but um, it might be a donor through a UK clinic. And so these donors will be uh, identifiable to a child once they're 18. And the child will be able to information about half siblings as well. So other children that have been made using the same donation. Um, you might be using a non-UK clinic. So perhaps you're going to Spain or um, other European country, you might be going to um, the United States. Um, so they will all have their own different ways of managing the process and different legal implications. So the, the, the legal 
situation in the UK is different to the legal situation in the States, different to the legal situation in Spain, the Czech Republic. And uh, there, most likely the donor will be anonymous. Um, in most cases it is. But it might also be that you get a lot of information. In some places they give you huge amounts of detail, even though you don't know the actual name or um, uh, personal uh, contact information about the donor. So there's a lot of different types of donor and some will be more right for some people than others. But it is worth thinking about the, the, the information that you'll have available and how important that feels for you as a family and how important that might be for a child. So Nina, Nina, that's, that's a sort of background. Yes. Sorry, Nina, to interrupt. Can I just come in? I think for some people, the connection is still a little bit slow. So um, what I might just okay. ask you to do, if possible, is stop sharing your screen, if you can, at, at the screen. Yep. There we go. Um, and what I thought we might do is if we just go back in to screen share again, and it should take us back to where we were at the presentation, because um, that might just allow the connection to... Sort of it. reboot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me try and do that. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I was That's fine. And I'm sorry that people, um, I don't know if it's my internet connection. It could be, um, that is, why is that happening? Sorry, everybody. We'll just wait and give, and, and give it time to see if it comes back. It was a really interesting presentation so far. Um, this is definitely one of the topics that um, people don't really know who to talk to to explore. So to find out about the Donor Conception Network it will, be, will help a lot of people to explore these issues. Well now I've got another problem. <laughs> I'm okay. really sorry everyone. My um, screen seems to have just decided that it doesn't want to... Uh, it doesn't want to behave at all. Oh, okay. there we go. There we go. Right. Okay. Uh, so I feel that the technical problems are probably my end rather than anyone else's end. So shall I try sharing again? Yeah, if you try sharing yeah. again, I'll disappear and we'll have give it another go. Okay, we'll see whether that's any any better. Um, so yes, let Heather know if, if it's still the connection is really bad and uh, people are struggling to, to hear or to see. Okay, so we were just looking at things to consider. So I've covered quite a lot of ground already. There's, there's, there's a lot in that. Um, but then sort of thinking about where you are right now. So uh, it's important to recognize where you actually are on this journey. It may be that you've been trying for a long time and have finally come to the conclusion that donor conception is going to be the only way to make a family and you're not sure whether that's right or not. Uh, it may be that you've been thinking about donor conception for a long time and perhaps you're even working, to, working through some treatment options. Um, it may be that you've always known that you'd need to use donor conception and actually uh, you've, you've done the research and you're, you're really... So that's important to acknowledge. And to recognise that if you're in a couple, then actually you may not be at the same stage. So it's quite common for one person in the relationship to be more ready to go than the other, um, or somebody to have, have more questions or for it not to feel quite right for one person and for it to feel fine for another person. So it's really important to allow each other time to, to get on the same page, talk it through, keep, keep the conversation going. And of course, if you're on your own, the flip side can be a problem that you're having to manage all of these difficult decisions and complicated emotions on your own. So really you want to try and find some people that you can talk to um, and, and, and start building a bit of a network. And again, that's where we can come in. I think the other thing is that there is a process that most people go on when they're considering a donor conception. And that is a process of letting go of the child that can't be. Most people don't come to donor conception as a first choice and they would have assumed that they would make a child that was genetically connected to them or genetically connected to their partner and there can be a real grieving process um, letting go of that child who's not going to be coming into the family. 
And what that then allows you to do is to open up space for the child that could come in. And that's a different child uh, conceived in a different way, but that child could be the one that's meant for you. And um, so that's that, that's a, sort of a two two step process in a way. We're letting go of one child and allowing another one potentially to arrive. So is this all right for you, I should say? Um, and then on more practical details to, to things to think about. So you're going to need to think where you're going to have treatment. We've already talked about the fact that you can have donor conception treatment in all sorts of different countries with different legal restrictions. How you choose your donor. Um, just an, a note that if you are using a known donor, so somebody who's who really important to consider how you're going to manage the boundaries of that. You might want to think about the possible each contact for your child for the donor with the donor um, is that important is it not important and again possible information that's half siblings so it's sort of managing expectations both yours managing a potential child's expectations and wishes and of course managing a donor's expectations as well assuming that that's a, it's a person that, that that could be um that could have contact information for Something else that might be worth thinking about is how much emotional energy you've got. Uh, it can be a really grueling perception is also quite grueling. And it may be that actually you need to put some boundaries around that. Um, and similarly, um, other resources that you might need to put, put some boundaries around. How much money have you got? Um, how much time have you got? How much support have you got that's going to actually enable you to go through one cycle, three cycles, four cycles. Um, at some point, you know, you may need to may, may need to consider um, how much energy you've got to go forward. And then we've got the issues around telling, which I'm going to come on to later. So, how are you going to tell? Who are you going to tell? Do you have to? Um, it's private information, so why you why why do you need to share it with anybody? And of course, how are you going to make all these decisions and where are you going to get support? And I think I'm just going to finish off all these things to consider by saying, you know, does it need to be perfect? And I think the answer to that is no, things don't have to be perfect. They need to be good enough that you feel a confidence in taking the next step. So lots of feelings can come up for people. Um, there's the grief over the loss of genetic connection. That might be your own genetic connection or the genetic connection to uh, your, the part, your partner's connection to the child. Um, sometimes it can feel like you're not going to be a real mum or real dad if, you're not, uh, if, you're not, um, you, if your child hasn't been created with your eggs or your sperm. There can be fears over bonding, fears over telling, really not wanting to talk about it or acknowledge it. It's just too painful. And it can be a difficult process weighing up the normal privacy feelings of, you know, that's a natural wish to be private about your life. Um, but just being careful that hasn't actually transformed into keeping secrets um, and maybe a sense of shame around how you've created your child. And then, of course, there can be a sense of fear about the donor. Who is this person and what impact are they going to have on the family? So just a, a couple of other issues that can come up when you're using donor conception. Um, on, again, sort of more practical issues. So medical questions. So that can be really difficult um, to, to, to be in a situation where you are not able to provide medical background information about your child. Uh, for single people, it can, be, it can be difficult to be thinking, OK, I'm doing this on my own and this is not what I planned. Um, if you're a lesbian couple, and you're not carrying the baby, uh, using surrogacy and not carrying the baby, it can be difficult to feel like, well, am I going to be a, a, a real mum if I haven't had a pregnancy? And of course, just to, just to remember that this is, <laughs> this is potentially a wonderful thing also, um, there can be real joy and excitement that actually, after having thought there wasn't a way to have a baby or it's not going to happen, that there is this possibility. Um, and that, that can be really exciting. Okay, so we've talked about openness, and I know that openness is a really challenging thing for a lot of people. So I'm just going to re go over some of the basic 
reasons why openness is a good thing, why we would say openness is a good thing. Um, I think our starting point is that you know secrets in families are not great, um, and so it's not a good start to family life and not a good foundation for family life. Um, balanced with that, I think donor conceived people deserve to know the truth about how they were made and truth about their, their, their background and origins. And then on a more practical level, often it's actually much harder to keep a secret than you might think. So we know that um, it can, you know, many people just think, well, why would we confuse things? But then from the very minute that the baby arrives, the questions come oh doesn't she look like you or she doesn't look like you where does he get his curly hair from talents family likenesses are a constant conversation within families and it can feel very quick to feeling like you're actually lying or misleading people and indeed misleading your child so so it is a harder thing to keep a secret than you might imagine. Um, Dan really supports open openness and um, supports the fact that when children grow up knowing this information from the get-go, actually it, it just becomes part of their identity and part of who they are. Uh, the one thing we know that is difficult often is finding out later in life. So finding out as a teenager or an adult, particularly if it's been a discovery by accident, so it wasn't, wasn't planned a planned sharing of information led by parents and uh, we know from older older D dc adults um that they can say things like how can i ever trust my parents again and what else have they lied to me about they've lied to me about something so important as this and as a final uh, reason um so home dna testing is becoming ever more popular and we know that people are buying their parents and grandparents and siblings delay so I think the fact that it's going on so much at the moment and, and people are putting their DNA online they're finding family connections through through genetic connections uh, the chance of any child conceived today not doing something similar and not realizing that they're not actually genetically connected to a parent or a sibling um it's 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 going to be impossible to keep this a secret so i think going forward with openness is a is a really strong starting point and just to be clear it's important even if the donor is anonymous because what you're conveying here is not information about the donor necessarily there might be information about the donor but it's more that you're just being honest about the fact that you or your partner are not genetically connected to this child or that somebody outside of the family is genetically connected to this child and it means that they can give an accurate picture of their medical history looks or talents and temperaments um, and it just drive the point home as i said dna testing is becoming so popular that it's not so much about who the donor is it's just about the the honest fact that a donor has been used so why can it feel so daunting um for most people i'd, I'd just like to, to to if anyone's thinking I, i'd like to be open but i'm terrified um you're not alone and i think most people feel very anxious about the prospect um it is you know it it's understandable it's not sharing it's not it's sharing something that often can bring up a lot of emotions in a parent um there can be a sense of embarrassment maybe shame about inception um there can be a sense of this being a really, really private issue why do i have to talk about it um you know other people don't talk about how they've conceived their children necessarily uh maybe a sense that family or friends might be going to judge you for what you've done or for the choices that you've made uh, maybe just a practical thing how am I going to do this what words am I going to use and again sometimes people who've been abroad have anonymous donors think well if I've been a, if I have an anonymous donor what what's the point of being open um, so uh, we've just we've sort of gone over a little bit of that why it's still important so I think um, we had a really good quote from one of our members. So Dominic uh, is a sperm donation dad and he's got two children. Um, 
and with his daughter he said well before she was born it was all about me and how unfair it was that I couldn't have my own genetic child but now she's here I see that it's all about her and because I love her so much I want to be honest with her about how she began and I think that's another thing to remember is that quite often there is a shift and how people feel before they've had a child and after they've had a child can be quite different so it's worth just putting that out there and have, having that in your mind as you're going forward with all these complicated decisions. And just remembering that this isn't bad news, this is just information, it's just the truth. That's all you're sharing. Take it as, 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 as something devastating but actually assuming that it's come, uh, led by parents and um, there's no reason why children could, can't just absorb that as part of who they are and the truth of their origins now that isn't to say that their feelings might not change over time they may have questions about some difficult questions that you need to answer um, identity and a sense of, of um, self uh, because they would have grown up knowing this information from the start they're they, they would have integrated it into who they are. And where can you get help with all of this? So I'm going to point you in the direction of her charity. Um, we have a huge amount of experience. We've got lots of resources. And um, I think just to say whatever issue you're going through, we will have seen somebody and helped somebody through that. I'm sure something similar. Um, I think we've been the leaders in uh, the social and emotional issues around creating families this way and certainly a leader in openness. And as a 25 years, year old charity, we, we, we've certainly got a lot of experience. Um, on a more practical level, we have a website with lots and lots of information. Uh, we have books, books for children to help explain to them how they were made, books for adults, to help them with thinking about telling and talking, how, the when, the why, loads of great, great information in these booklets. We run workshops, uh, workshops for people who are considering having children. And once you've had children, we have workshops called Telling and Talking to help you think about how you might share this information. So just to finish off, last couple of slides, I hope we haven't gone too far over time. Um, so decision-making. If you're a couple, just recognize that you and your partner may not be at the same stage and you may not be going at the same speed. So you need to allow time for catching up. If you're single, you need to start building a village because you're gonna need a team. You need to give yourself some time and space to explore all the options you've got, all the difficult feelings that are coming up for you. But at the same time, give yourself a, 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 a boundary, a timed, a time frame um, so you don't feel that this is going to drag on for years and years and of course consider attending one of our workshops or joining our network so it's really important to put some energy into this on a practical level talk to us talk to close friends and family do the research you need get any counseling you need make sure you're sharing with your partner and this is the time to allow your difficult questions and difficult feelings to be explored let it everything out so that you can really analyze what's going to work for you and what's going to make you feel confident about whatever next steps you take uh, be easy with yourself you know you're making really important choices and decisions and you're doing it at a really difficult time time actually you're probably feeling quite overwhelmed probably feeling under a certain amount of pressure so be gentle with yourself it's not easy and remember that you will make a decision uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect decision it has to be good enough and right for you and how do you know if it's right for you so I think it's an individual question and a couple question. Uh, you may need to grieve the child that you can't have before you know if donor conception is going to be right for you. And it may relate to some degree about how you feel about genetics, how you feel about difference, how you feel about a donor being involved in the creation of your family. Um, whether you feel that being a parent is more important than having a little mini me if you're the non-genetic parent. 
and and might relate to how you feel about talking about this story with your child and with other people. So if you can get to a point where you feel comfortable with those issues, then that might be a point where you can start to really move forward. So to finish off, Sam, who is one of our DC adults now, as a younger teenager, um, was at one of our conferences and, and basically said, you know, people seem to get so stressed out about it all. I think they should just chill out more. If they're anxious to do the right thing, they probably will do the right thing. So I think it's building your confidence because confident parents will raise more and more likely to raise confident children. So you can embrace your decision, you can relax and you can move forward. Thank you, Sam, for those wise words. OK, thank you all very much. I hope the connection has held for the last bit of the presentation. And um, I hope that everyone's been able to hear OK and follow the presentation. So thank you and take some questions. OK, Nina, could you just stop sharing your screen for me? Yeah, thank I you. will try. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. I've got to say, Nina, that was an absolutely excellent presentation. Really excellent. Explored so many issues and um, explored them so well. Um, so the sense of openness, I felt that that really came through in that presentation because you were just saying probably exactly what was going through a lot of people's minds, but quite often feel that they can express those feelings. So thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, I thought I would start off just with a question, which is you talked about the need for emotional energy. And quite often, as you said, when you've had fertility mm -hmm. problems, you can feel very drained as an individual. Um, and we talked about time boundaries. You don't want to let it drag on for years and years. So how much time and space do you generally find that people need to explore their options and their feelings before they feel ready to make a decision? Um, okay, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think it's it, like most answers. I'm going to say it. Uh, it depends a little bit on how. Like some of those last questions that I raised. You know, if all of them are really triggering, so you just think, oh no, no, no. Then maybe those you think, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I, that, that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't worry me any of that. Then maybe you're, you're in a position where you can move forward more quickly. I mean, there was a time, the, the egg donation waiting list is, is pretty good in the UK now, pretty short. Um, but a couple of years ago, the, the wait list times sort of seemed to be averaging sort of six, nine, maybe 12 months. And I remember speaking to a lot of people on the phone who, who, would, who would be saying, oh, you know, it seems like a long time to wait and saying, you know, that, that, that you know, a baby takes nine months to, to be ready to arrive. And there's a reason sometimes that things take a little bit of time to allow you to get ready to, to prepare both psychologically and practically. And I sometimes used to think it was quite helpful having that, having that nine month wait for an egg donor. Because it gave people that time, for sort of sort of enforced time, but it wasn't too long. We're not talking about two years or something. Um, so it does very much depend on an individual. But I, I do think that that you're more likely to see people rushing because of the that the really powerful drive to get that baby. Um, and I would just say, just try and rein that one in because because you can end up like you know there's so many so many bits to the decision making process that 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 feeling of panic and rushed can just mean you 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 end up bypassing some really important steps um i but you know i'm saying that and i'm also very aware that 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 drive is very powerful so um absolutely but the, the the waiting time can also give um sort of the other um person if you're in a couple can give the other absolutely. person time to absorb it and accept the information too because as you said it's very rare that emotionally yeah. 
both people in the couple are, think exactly the same way Absolutely. about the prospect of donor conception. So again, it just gives you time to maybe have some counselling, have some counselling separately, have some counselling together, and and just not not rushing it too much. Obviously, you need a boundary. You need you need to make a decision at some point. But um, uh, but yeah, it's 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 worth putting some time in. Yeah, lovely. Okay, I'm going to have a look at um, some questions that have been submitted. Okay, now I hope I say this right. Please ask Nina what her thoughts are on epigenetics. Uh, well, I, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I'm not a scientist and I'm not a geneticist or an epigeneticist or, a, or anything is, I don't think. Um, uh, but my understanding is that uh, uh, well, epigenetics is hugely important, but it it isn't specifically relating related to donor conception. Um, so, as, as I understand it, epigenetics is the fact is is the process by which, if we're talking about an embryo, as an embryo develops and as a baby develops and grows, that the environment that they're in will in encourage or discourage certain genes from expressing or not expressing. And so if the environment is favorable and, and nourishing and has all the right, right uh, ingredients for them, that they're more likely will be, um, will be turned on and genes that maybe would, could, could cause problems will, will be downplayed. So I'm putting it in very much a you know, non-scientific language here. And so what that can, what that can do is it, if, you're, if you're having a baby through egg donation, uh, it can really make you feel like, uh, give, give you a sense of control over this situation. So, so it's not, it's, it's not, you're not changing the, the DNA of the baby in the sense that the DNA arrives as in the baby to help it be the best, the best it can, the strongest it can. And, um, so that can be very empowering. And I, and I think that actually that, that process goes on through life. So diet, exercise, activities all help your genes to express healthily or not and so um so yeah that that's i can't i can't really provide i'm glad you answered that nina because i don't think i would have answered that half as eloquently as you did um there was a little bit of a disruption to the connection there but i think we managed to hear your answer quite clearly um in the end so so that's good i'm going to see what other i'm so sorry everybody the 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 i don't know what Nina, it really is not, it's not spoiling the webinar at all because um, we're really tackling some interesting topics here and, um, and we can get the gist of what you're saying, so that's fine. I'm gonna have a look at another question. Right, we're struggling to decide whether to use a UK or overseas donor, and it would be a Spanish one. We understand the legal and, uh, and not anonymity differences, but struggling to make the decision and move forward. Can you advise? Um, well, I think it depends on why, what, what, what the question is. Um, I'm guessing that maybe it's a, it's a waiting list issue. Uh, because because the Spanish clinics have availability pretty much sort of straight away, whereas in most clinics here there is a short wait. Um, although I would say if if the clinic that you're with in the UK, if you'd like to stay in the UK, uh, so so if that if that's if if it's that you you'd rather stay in the UK, but you're but you're feeling under time pressure, and and Spain have um, have offered a, an egg donor almost immediately it might be worth contacting a couple of other clinics. I uh, don't know where you are in the country, but certainly, you know, in London, there are, there are, or around the country, there are clinics that have very, and you would like to stay in the UK. So that's, that's you know, if, if actually for you, there are good reasons to go abroad, then you need to factor those in as well. Um, I mean, if, it, if it's more just that you're, you're not sure about having a, an identifiable donor, then 
then you know that's a slightly bigger question so um i think sometimes parents can feel uncomfortable with the idea of having an identifiable donor because the person feels more real more like they they could arrive you know on the doorstep or um could take up too much space in the family story because they're a a, a, a person who, who whose contact details are going to um be available at some point and if that is if that is the concern then I suppose I'd say two things. So one would be that donors generally, that is not what they're looking for. Um, and that is generally not what donor conceived people are looking for when they do seek out information. Uh, that there, there can be a real curiosity, but the curiosity is about where they come from, who they're connected to. They're not looking for new parents or new family in that sense. Um, and I suspect that, that Spanish donors will be, will also be traceable if somebody wishes to, in, which, you know, we're talking 20 years time from now. Um, if things are as they are today, uh, you know, what, what what we're seeing the explosion of 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 people taking these tests the number of contacts that are uh, connected uh, i just can't believe there's going to be any you know anywhere to hide um so it may be slightly immaterial uh, and then the issue might be more around whether the donors have been counselled well to to understand the implications of what they're doing and we would hope that donors in the UK are being counselled well and and are taking responsibility for, for for their donation whereas maybe in Spain if they're still being told oh don't worry it's going to be anonymous maybe they're not they're not really expecting or, um, and of course, half siblings is the other issue that half siblings may want to, the child may want to know if there are other children uh, a, a, a alive who share 50% of their genetic material. So I can't answer that. Um, all I, can, I mean, what I can say is that we have lots and lots of members in the network who've had treatment abroad, um, and I. I think the, the 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 most important thing that we would see in the network is confidence in parents about the decisions that they've made. So it, it isn't actually so much about the actual decision. It's finding something that feels right for you. So probably worth thinking why why are you weighing up these two options and um, and which one what's what's the positive for you of one and the positive for you of the other and then how do how do they compare in terms of uh, how valuable they are to you um, so without knowing a bit please at dcnetwork.org and and ask the question again um, with a little bit more detail or join sign up and we can connect you with some people who've had treatment in spain and families who've had treatment in the uk that's great and um there were so many different scenarios there and so many different reasons for asking that question that, that your experience then, Nina, really shone through in answering that about the different reasons and the different things to consider. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a question here. Somebody, I'm wondering if Nina can give any thoughts or advice around how to move from finally accepting going solo to finding it's too late and needing to look at double donor. It just feels so hard accepting I have to move on, but it seems this is the only real way to grow my own child. I'm sure there must have been many others in this situation. Any thought from the other side? Um, well, thoughts from the other side are, are, again, we have lots and lots of single women who've used double donation. Um, and, uh, we, you know, at our conferences when uh, parents and and thinkers as well so it's not not everyone um, has had children but if they have had children they can bring their children we have a big crash and you'll see them there with their young kids or older kids teenagers uh, and it's that they are normal families in that there is no such thing as a normal family you know they're, they're, all of our families look different 
behave differently, have different views and values and all sorts. Um, but I, I, I understand it is, I think, a big shift for most single women to go from thinking about sperm donation to double donation. Um, and I think they, we certainly know that some of the, some of the single women in our network almost feel more, uh, more connection with het couple, heterosexual couples who've used egg donation because they can sort of share in that, for, for the woman, in that loss of a genetic connection to their child. Uh, and can feel more closeness there even than perhaps with some of the single women who've used sperm donation but have been able to use their own eggs. Um, it is, it's, it's not easy and for some people they decide that's a step too far that you know that that point uh, comes and they think okay I think something is telling me that this is not the way that I'm going to build my family and either they decide to remain childless or maybe they pursue adoption or fostering instead or you know it, it it can be a line and everybody's got different lines um so maybe it's a line for you i don't know but i think it is one one positive is that for women because women's fertility is is uh is, is different to men so there is a cutoff and it does decline quite rapidly so we're under a lot more pressure than the men. Um, and one advantage to, to using egg donation is it takes the pressure off slightly. Uh, sometimes we have single women joining who are maybe in their early 40s and they really have got to get a move on with making their decisions. They don't have time to hang around because otherwise they're going to suddenly find um, that their egg quality isn't good enough and they're, and they're quickly moving from one thing to, to the other. So once you know that actually that is your next step, it's bought yourself some time. So maybe, you know, give yourself a few months at least to really consider how you feel about this. Um, maybe get some counselling, uh, maybe connect with us and connect with some single women who've done it so you can speak to them about what's difficult. Because there are some other implications, just a, a final point, that obviously it depends on how old you are. That can be another factor. So for some people, you know, we've, 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 we've got women in the network who became mums in their 50s. Um, but we have other people that we speak to who clearly, uh, you know, they feel like they they don't feel that it's the right the right time for them to be having a baby. They have they've missed that 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 window, and and that's a fine decision. And that's a you know that's it's it's got to be right for you. And um, spending a bit of time to work out whether it is going to be right for you is what I would recommend. Okay, another question here is, as a single woman who's just decided this route, please can you advise of the basics? Do I go to my doctor for fertility testing or do I have to go to a clinic? I'm just 40, so don't know if the whole process has to be private. That's an excellent question. Uh, I, um, I think you probably can have some tests done at your GP. I think, think I, I cannot give a definitive answer on that on this, but my understanding is that that some GPs are very are very supportive, and others are not so supportive. So I would go along to your GP and explain what you're planning to do. Um, may it might be worth having an appointment with a clinic to to start off with, just to to get their advice on on what tests would be helpful and um, maybe just just check with them. What you don't want to do is get in a situation where you delay things because you you go to the GP, you get the tests done there, then you go to the clinic and the clinic say, oh, we don't like the GP uh, tests, we don't trust them, or we do we like to do our own anyway, and then you've you know you've wasted that time. Um, but we certainly know that some some women have managed to get quite sort of um, the preliminary uh, um, tests and things done on the NHS. So give it a go. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've heard the same as you, Nina, that, that you go to your GP and it does depend a lot on your GP, but um, you, you obviously do need to pay at the clinics for testing, mm. etc. But some, some of the early blood tests and things, I think, can be done through your, your GP anyway. Right, another question. Is there any regulation on charges in the UK? 
for example, Spain has a lower cost. Um, no, as far as I'm aware, there is no, no regulation on charges. Um, it is an issue. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I, that, that, there's, there's nothing else I can really say. Karen, just, just re remember to factor in things like travel, um, accommodation, um, and, and just issues around not being at home. So having to go, having to go such a long distance. So sometimes when you do the maths, it actually ends up not being much cheaper than staying here. But we, you know, I'd be much cheaper. So. Yeah, absolutely. The, the travel costs need to be factors in, factors in, in as well, don't they? Okay, I think we have answered most of the questions. So I've just got a little bit of um, housekeeping to do. Um, Nina, is there anything else that you want to, to say tonight before we, we draw the um, this to a close? No, I think that uh, I've probably probably um, said too much. <laughs> It was a you know a pretty a pretty solid amount of information to go to the website have a look there's lots of information and um and maybe to consider joining because if you and consider a workshop if you're if you're very very undecided so um we have a preparation workshops and uh, we had a wonderful quote. We're going to have to capture it somehow. But on Twitter, somebody went recently to going, <clears throat> and then they sent a couple of tweets afterwards, just raving about the weekend. And we know we get really, really good feedback. They're not cheap. Uh, we run them at cost. We don't make any profit, but they're just they're just expensive to run. But but um, <clears throat> but maybe consider coming to the workshop. I think it's just having it's just having a place where where that discourse is allowed and and any questions are allowed that people find reassuring because mm -hmm. as you say it's a very difficult thing to talk about to people who don't understand the decisions that you you have to make and yeah. and the things that you have to consider when you're doing that so so yeah it yeah. sound wonderful okay well I think that's that's all we've got time for tonight um, from the questions. Thank you so much, Nina, for supporting Fertility Network and giving up your time so freely for this session tonight. Um, it's proved to be really useful and it's really given us a much better understanding of a lot of the issues around donor conception. And certainly it's made us all feel a lot more confident about coming to Donor Conception Network to ask the questions as well, which is great. Um, we do hope to have this recording available in the next two weeks or so. Um, there are some key members of staff on holiday, so it might take a little bit longer than it usually does. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in our Trying to Conceive series, which will be on Wednesday the 24th of July. And it's going to look at types of yoga that you can employ when you are trying to conceive so that will be interesting too we hope to have the registration for that set mm -hmm. up soon so keep an eye on our website um, as you normally do and of course we'll send out social media about it as well now we can send you a direct reminder about that um, webinar and other future webinars in the 2019 series but only if you provide us with permission to send you those updates so if you would like to give your consent to receive details of further webinars just email me heather at fertilitynetworkscotland.org stating clearly that you would like to receive a reminder for the TTC webinars and I'll send you all the terms and conditions that come with that. Obviously we won't share your email address with any other organisation and we will only send you one reminder for each webinar in the 2019 series and of course we can take you off the list if you ask us to at any time. Um, a sincere thank you once again to Nina and of course, everybody else that's come here tonight to join us. Um, good night, Nina. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank you, everybody. And thanks for inviting me.